So, prayer and fasting. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing for us to do. And thank you so much. I, I just want to kind of combine prayer and fasting with the parasha, this week's parasha. Uh, this week's parasha is in Exodus. It, be, it begins in Exodus 6. For those of you who don't understand the word parasha, that's the portion that we are to read. If you look at your bulletins, you will see on the front the listing of the reading for this week, the listing of the reading for next week. Those are the parasha. And in synagogues all over the world, the Torah and the Haftorah, or the prophets, are read. And then, of course, being messianic, we add a new covenant reading to it. So it's always good if you can prepare your hearts to have this read before you come. You never can tell. I might speak from the parsha like this evening. So I would think that the children of Israel who left slavery in Egypt, they saw what God had, had done, all these miracles, and they would hunger for revival. You know, we're praying and fasting to see revival fall on us. And I would imagine they would have done the same thing, that because revival is knowing God and having this incredible zeal for him and a desire to obey him. And even though they kept experiencing God's miracles as we read the Torah, unfortunately, this was not their experience. They didn't run after God. In fact, after a while, a very short while, I might say, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Can we learn something from them in 2024, 4,000 years ago? This experience happened. Can we learn something on how to respond to God? So let's read a little bit. We're going to even though, uh, let's see, let's read starting in verse 5, Exodus 6. Furthermore, I have heard, and God is speaking, I have heard the groaning of B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians are keeping in bondage. So I have remembered my covenant. So we know that a covenant is a promise, and God made many, many promises to the people of Israel all throughout Genesis and, and in other portions, but especially in Genesis. And we're going to look at the word bondage in a second, which is why the word bondage is in a different color, because I want you to really think about this word, bondage. It's really important to us as we go through this message. In verse 6, it says, Therefore, say to B'nai Yisrael, I am Adonai, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you to myself as a people, and I will be your God, and you will know that I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and give it to you as an inheritance. I am Adonai. Well, the first word let's look at is what is a burden? Well, that's a burden. Okay, a heavy load. That's the definition of a burden. It's a heavy load. And... God is saying to the people who are coming out of Egypt, I am uh, going to remove this heavy load. Now, heavy load can be depression, as you see up here, 
or it could be lots of things, but whatever it is, we carry it around with us wherever we go, and certainly the, peop the children of Israel were doing the very same thing. They were carrying this heavy load, besides the bricks, besides the things that physically they were carrying, they were carrying spiritual and emotional rocks, so to speak. Um, so picture being under a heavy load like this fellow. It's hard to move. You don't have freedom. You feel the pressure of the load. And you're not focused on God. You're focused on the load. And you have lost all faith and you have lost all hope, and you are depressed. So this is what it was like after 400 years to be a child of the living God, an Israel, a person of Israel. And we see another word besides the burden, and that's bondage or slavery. The word bondage means slavery. And slavery takes that heavy load, and even if you get many people together to try and lift it off your back, those who enslave you stop you from doing anything positive, any solving of the problem. Enslaving means you only do what they say. And slavery became the culture for our people in Egypt. So a burden along with a bondage created many emotional and spiritual problems. Now God promised he would redeem them. Now redeeming means you're compensated for whatever faults or bad things are going on, bad circumstances. You're compensated in some way. So God promises to compensate you by changing the, the problems that you're going through to some sort of positive solution. And so we see that what he did was he helped the slaves become free. And besides redeeming them, he promised them an inheritance. Now, an inheritance is what you receive from one of the past generations, something very positive. It could be land or finances, or it could be just uh, a legacy. God promised the solution will last from generation to generation. So this was not going to be a quick fix. His solution, his redemption, was going to be long term. And what was it in this specific case? He promised them land. The people of Israel would inherit the land from the owner. Who was the owner? God, right. God is the owner of the land, and in many places in the Torah, he promises that land will belong to the people of Israel. The problem for the people of Israel is that when they became free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, they wanted to return to Egypt because freedom required faith to follow God and get through the difficult times and slavery was kind of a security for them. And so they were willing to give up freedom to be a slave and go back. The problem for people of Israel is that when they became free, they wanted to return. They wanted to return. In Scripture, symbolically, Egypt often represents sin. So the people of Israel wanted to return to sin because that's what they were used to. In a sense, they were protected by sin. This is what they knew. This is how they grew up. This was the culture they knew and expected. Does this sound ridiculous? 
Some say yes, some say no. I think it's ridiculous, but who would want slavery over freedom? Who would feel protected in an abusive situation? Wouldn't people want to break away from the pain of the past and the present? Everyone has something in their past that has caused them pain. If it was continuous, you not only learned how to live with that pain, but find something that would soothe that pain. If you were abused as a child, you became enslaved to how it made you feel. Some people who are abused can't allow themselves to feel loved because they don't know if the person loving them is really showing love or if they're trustworthy or if they'll just turn out to be another abuser. They also can unintentionally become an, ab uh, 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 an abusive person themselves as they get older. And, and though they said, I'll never act like this, guess what? They do. They are, they're, they're different types of slavery. And they're different types of heavy loads. And people who have this kind of history, this kind of baggage, this kind of stuff in their lives, they carry this wherever they go, and they are enslaved even though they know Yeshua as Messiah. They are enslaved by their thinking process. They're enslaved because of their history. I suspect that there was more unity in Egypt for the people of Israel than there was when they were free. When oppressed, there's only one thing you can do, and that is you have to be obedient. No other choice. When you're free, you can say what you want, you can believe what you want, you can act the way you want. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So when free, the baggage and the personalities and the desires of each other cause disunity and anger and jealousy and rage and fear, all of these things were probably somewhat new to the people of Israel who were too tired to be angry and raging after a day of being a slave. They were just happy to eat and go to bed. When, when God promised them an inheritance internally, the people of Israel probably asked themselves, is there a God? Can he really be trusted if there is a God? It's been almost 400 years. Why now? And they started it, right? The phrase, you know, bad things seem to happen to good people. So is it a fairy tale that promises me an inheritance? So in our congregation... There are a number of people who are enslaved and don't know it. Like the children of Israel, it is easier to stay a slave than to deal with the ugliness and, and deal with the ugliness of slavery, which is their history. And in some crazy way, they feel comfort in that place rather than experience the unpredictability of freedom. So many people today want to stay in Egypt because it's too hard to experience freedom. Those people react poorly to others 
when given freedom. They can be addicted to drugs and alcohol, which is how they soothe, or they can be addicted to anger and a critical spirit. Believe it or not, at some crazy way, that actually soothes them as well for a moment. Not long, but for a moment. And this is why we struggle having unity in our congregation and in most congregations. This is why we struggle to love one another. This is why we can show compassion to some and not to others. Because we have the freedom to do so. Of course, if you're under God, well, we'll get to that scripture. So, in Scripture, it describes our actions as we're either walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is following God, and walking in the flesh is following our own desires. So, we can read the Scripture and not apply it to ourselves, because we would prefer to have the security of slavery than the insecurity of freedom and having to follow God in, in this crazy way of obeying him and yet having the freedom to do what we want. So Galatians 5.19 says, Now the deeds of the flesh are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Take your pick of which one describes your difficulty. Take your pick. Don't choose more than two. That'll confuse you. So if we want our full inheritance, we need the Bible to lead us to the promised land, so to speak, symbolically. A personal relationship with God is our promised land through Yeshua, our, our promised land, besides the physical land in Israel, is a personal relationship with God through Yeshua. Galatians 5.1, for freedom... Messiah set us free, so stand firm and do not be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. So that is the initial instruction. You need to pray if there is something blocking you called slavery, the burden, the yoke. You've got to pray and see, is there something from your past that you keep referring to that stops you from the breakthrough that God wants you to have, which is freedom in him? Receiving Yeshua into our hearts has set us free from slavery. However, we don't realize that complete freedom, unless we choose to be enslaved to Yeshua and his teachings. Okay, that makes no sense. How can you be enslaved to something and receive freedom? Because... God knows best. <laughs> it's that simple. And so if we do what he says, he opens up the windows of heaven for us. And he pours out blessings until we can't even contain them. Galatians 5.13, Brothers and sisters, you were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 
For the whole Torah can be summed up in a single saying, love your neighbor as yourself. So, freedom means, from, a, from God's point of view, through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. Now, if you want to get nitpicky, we can say, well, it didn't mean everybody. It just meant the congregation, or it just meant certain people, or it just... If you want to interpret it that way, go for it. But I would say you're wrong. The problem is God wants us to love everybody, and he wants us to be servants. Servants showing our love. This is what we sign up for when we make Yeshua number one in our life and we are enslaved by him based on our own choice. It's based on our choice to be enslaved. As believers, we can unfortunately be also enslaved by the flesh. An example would be if we're subject to having a judgmental spirit. Now, I know nobody in our congregation has judgmental spirits. You're supposed to laugh. And that's why they can pick and choose who they love and who they don't. If you don't perform correctly, if you don't do something correctly, then, hey, I don't have to love you. This is what people do in their minds and hearts when they don't want to take responsibility for their actions. God knows our natural inclination. We see it in the next verse. In verse 15 of Galatians 5, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not destroyed by another, one another. God is specific in his word what he desires from us. When we follow his word, we experience freedom, and our flesh cannot enslave us. So what is his word? Well, we look at Galatians 5, to 24, since we're in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Ruach, the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So that is who we're trying to be. So, once again, let me give you an example. If you walk in here and I say, well, how are you doing? And you say, not very well. I, I really feel like I've, I'm, I'm just upset and I'm depressed. Well, let me give you another name for that. You're enslaved to your flesh. Because God said, if you have his spirit, then you should have love, joy, now, look, we're never going to be perfect at this, but we have to know when we are not pleasing God. And we have to desire to change. 
So when we're not joyful, we're not pleasing God. And that's really difficult to think about. In verse 25, if we live by the Ruach, let us walk by the Ruach, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, and so on. Look, we want revival. This requires us to seek God and his ways. So I've written a short prayer. If you feel comfortable, you can say that prayer with me. You know, God wants us to be free because he knows if we use our freedom to be enslaved by him, we will have the abundant life. So, feel free. Is it up there? Yes, it is. Lord, I want to live in freedom, not in slavery. Whoops. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Thank you. Open my eyes so I can see what is holding me back from having real freedom. Getting my own way is not your desire. Rather, following your way will lead me to freedom and the abundant life you desire for me. Lord, you have given me many promises. Help me realize them. Whoops, I changed that, didn't I? Help me focus on them as I work to get rid of everything that enslaves me. You have said a key to freedom is not being judgmental but rather, through love, serve others. I don't want to go back to Egypt. Even though I might struggle, I want to journey with you and come to the land you have promised. As I do your will, revive me. As I am revived, help me to encourage others, and may revival spread. I am praying for the freedom to make the right choices. I love you, Lord. I love your word. During this last week of fasting and praying, I ask you to transform me into an agent of freedom and a transmitter of the power of your love. Lord, I just pray this prayer for all of us. I pray, Lord, that this week be a week where we get real with the Lord. And more importantly, real with ourselves. That we will come to the Lord and just say, do what you need to do, Lord, because I want to serve you and obey you and thus have abundant life as you have designed it. Lord, I just ask now that you be with myself and each and every person who is here or on Facebook Live, that we will be an example of one who believes, but not from our own understanding, but from yours, Lord. We welcome you into our hearts. Do what you need to do. I pray this in the name of Yeshua.